Um, my name is Brenna Bandar, and I work in the School of Law at SOAS at the University of London. I'm a part of Black Feminists and a variety of other groups. I'm going to introduce our panel to begin with. Um, we have Nevlin Naji, who is the director of the film we just watched, a dancer and multimedia artist from Northampton, Massachusetts. Her work focuses on the internal struggles and transformative experiences of black female characters using experimental and non-linear storytelling devices in film. Naji's first feature-length documentary, Reflections Unheard, uh, first screened with MSNBC show host and producer Melissa Harris Perry in 2012 prior to its release. Naji currently lives in, well, Nevlin, currently lives and works in Brooklyn, New York as a filmmaker, and her latest project is titled Genesis of Nine. Uh, sitting next to Nevlin is Haley Reed, who's a documentary filmmaker. In 2007, she co-produced a short documentary film titled One Size Fits All for the British Film Institute, which was later screened at the 22nd London Lesbian Gay uh, Lesbian and Gay Film Festival in 2008. Uh, Haley has collaborated numerous vi collaborated with numerous visual artists and activists internationally, and in 2010, she successfully won the Channel 4 First Shots competition and made the film Sister Survival, which is about black women activists' involvement in the struggles against racism, sexism, and classism in the 1970s and 80s. The film was broadcasted on the Community Channel for Black History Month in 2010, 2011, and 2012. And her most recent project was work on a film directed by Pratiba Parmar titled Alice Walker, Beauty and Truth, which was released this, this year. Uh, and finally, we have Sunera Tobani, who is Associate Professor at the Institute for Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice at the University of British Columbia, which is in Vancouver in Canada. Her scholarship focuses on critical race, post-colonial and feminist theory, globalization, citizenship, and migration, as well as Muslim women, the war on terror, and, and representations of Muslim women in the media. She has authored a book entitled Exalted Subjects, Studies in the Making of Race and Nation in Canada, which was published in 2007, and has published widely in a number of academic journals. Sunera is a founding member of the Researchers and Academics of Color for Equity, Race, a cross-Canada network promoting the scholarship of academics of color and of indigenous ancestry. And she's also the past president of the National Action Committee on the Status of Women, uh, Canada's then largest feminist organization in the 90s. And for, if there are any Canadians in the audience, you'll know how, um, how large and, and significant um, uh, NAC uh, was at that time in particular. Um, okay, we're going to begin uh, with uh, having Nevlin talk about the process um, of making this film. Uh, after that, I'm going to pose a few questions to the panelists and then we will then open up the discussion uh, to the audience. So, Nevlin? Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, so, um, one of the uh, main questions I always get is, is what the, the process was like making the film, um, which I love to talk about. Um, so there were, okay, the, the film was first not going to be only about the civil rights movement, it was going to be about what I called racial misogyny, uh, discrimination against black women specifically in society, and it was going to have a civil rights component. And I realized that, you know, through research that the civil rights movement was the perfect time when all of these dynamics of, you know, um, race and gender discrimination, it was being talked about, it was being televised, it sort of just exploded. And so I wanted to make it about civil rights and just focus on that. Um, the process itself, uh, I worked on this mostly by myself. Of course, I did receive some generous support occasionally from uh, certain individuals, but I did, uh, I was a jack of all trades, um, and I worked on this project apart from my school curriculum, so it was a, a side project, and I finished it after I graduated. 
Um, the interviews came from, I selected the women that I selected based on just um, a lot of heavy research. I chose women who pushed the boundaries of what, of, you know, what was expected of black women during that time in the movement. Um, the archival footage, uh, so basically I, okay, that was the, the most challenging part of making this film, or one of the most challenging parts is acquiring the, once I figured out that I, how I wanted to style it, acquiring the archival footage and uh, I always like to talk about that because of the racism that I uh, encountered while acquiring the resources for this film, that basically in, uh, back when this footage was shot, it was mostly shot by white male filmmakers who, uh, you know, they shot the footage, went into black communities or owned the television stations, put the footage in these institutions, and now the institutions sell it for a, about you know fifty dollars per second, two hundred fifty dollars per second, uh, and this includes public television stations, all sorts of, you know, this is how they make their money. And of course, it's not accessible to somebody like me or another marginalized filmmaker who doesn't have a large budget. It's going to be only accessible to, uh, you know, white male filmmakers who have huge budgets. Um, who can make these films about, you know, that are voyeuristic about the black community and don't have this type of perspective. So um, it, I had to do a lot, a lot, a lot of research to find public domain footage, to find uh, connections with people who had footage to offer me for a cheaper rate um, and Creative Commons footage. So that's how I acquired it. Um, Okay, um, thank you so much. Um, that was really informative and, and, um, and very interesting. And we could talk about the ownership of images, I think, for much, much longer. But um, we'll move on, I think, with some other questions. Um, the first question I'd like to pose to the panel is about um, how we connect the historical ground that's covered in the film so, so beautifully, so well, with the first chapter sort of looking at the masculinity and sexism of the Black Power Movement, and particularly the Black Panthers. And then there's a second chapter where it seems, if I can just describe it like that, where um, the interviewees talk about the uh, fact that the mainstream women's movement failed to understand gender as a race category um, and also failed to really deal with issues of class um, and I was wondering if you could just reflect on how the historical ground that's covered in the film relates to uh, feminist organizing today. Um, in terms of um, feminist organization, organizing today, um, I've, I notice what sort of really resonated with me was, was the themes that came about within the film, um, themes around sort of workers' rights and um, uh, reproductive rights, and also education, partly on edu education, and health. Um, sort of these, these sort of issues are not really sort of dealt with so much nowadays. And um, my experience of sort of uh, doing sort of doing a some research within the, the Black Culture Archive, working on the Oral History Project there. Um, these were the same issues that were sort of popping up um, time and time again with the movements in the 70s and 80s. And with, with the rise of, sort of new technology, there's completely different focus. Um, a lot of the time we see a lot of focus on um, representation within the media, which is very important, but I've noticed that there, there is there's sort of ch changes uh, in terms of the focus on other issues that, that are just as prominent, like uh, reproductive rights and uh, workers' rights and also um, employment rights. Um, so yeah, there's, there's various sort of changes 
um, I think. Um, so I'd like to first thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to be on this panel, and I really want to congratulate Nevin. I think this is a fantastic film, and I think it's really, you know, despite the problems, and I'm sure there must have been many more than what you're telling us about, I just really want to say what a wonderful job you've done for all of us. Yeah. So, um, you know, when I look at the historical grounding of, of, of uh, this particular struggle, its emergence, the organizations, I think it's really important not just to see this as past history, because it's really created the space that we are in now. If we hadn't had these organizations, if we hadn't had the activists, the civil rights movement in the U.S., and black women's participation in it sparked off uh, movements for immigrants' rights in Canada, for example. You know, so it wasn't just, the, the impact wasn't just in uh, the U.S. or just within the Third World Women's Alliance. It actually sparked off and really fed and sustained um, immigrants' rights movements in other parts of North America, in Europe as well. So I think it's really important to acknowledge that contribution, that it w went much, much further than within the kind of black feminist community. The other thing, of course, this organizing gave us was the idea of intersectionality, right? How to think about race, class, gender, sexuality. And, uh, you know, this, I think, is, this was kind of the hands-on practical development of intersectionality as a concept, which has been incredibly useful to feminists outside the black uh, feminist movement. And you know, when I look at the women in there talk about the racism that they experience in the white women's <coughs> movement, I think it's, you know, I, I, I hesitate to call it much worse, but in many ways it is much worse today. Because there isn't that sense of a kind of cohesive women of color movement that's uh, internationalist in its consciousness, that's internationalist in its politics. When I think about the historical moment that's represented in this film, what comes afterwards is of course the containment of those revolutionary politics around the mechanism of the United Nations. And so we have all the feminists organizing now around UN conferences. And it ends up with a liberalization and a kind of doing away with the revolutionary vision that's articulated here. So I think, you know, when we think about politics today and women of color politics, you know, it's, it's not transformative in the way that it was. There, there isn't a vision of a larger fundamental change to society and how it's organized. And I think that you know, you've done us a really good service in kind of, you know, putting that revolutionary vision front and center. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And that sort of leads into the next question that I had about the way that the film ends with the focus on the Third World Women's Alliance and the genesis of that movement and also how internationalism was really at the core of at least a part of that um, black feminist politics. And I think um, what leads on from, from that is to think about some of what Sunera mentioned already, but I would like to know, um, you know what your further reflections are on thinking about um, the history of black feminism in the US and its connections with the history of and the present uh, of black feminism in the UK. Because of course here we have um, you know, a very different concept, I think, of um, you know, the notion of blackness, at least in the 60s and 70s, uh, maybe a little bit into the 80s. Um, <clears throat> but we, you know, the term women of color is something, to me at least, that seems uh, something that came out of a North American context much more. Um, and so I was wondering if you could just reflect on the differences and the connections between these two contexts. Well, for me, um, talking from sort of British perspective or the UK perspective, um, the black feminist sort of movement is definitely um, built up uh, between the solidarity between African, Caribbean and Asian sisters that have come together. And, it, and that's definitely black as, as a political term. And that's 
so I coined in the 70s, I think, or maybe the early 80s. Um, and this is a tradition that we've had here, and it's worked for us. And, and the women of color, women of color sort of, I wouldn't say phenomenon, but, uh, you know, that's been sort of, uh, it's associated with, with the, the U.S., um, the U.S. movement um, is, is quite a similar sort of thing, but in terms of um, the internationalism in relation to the anti-imperialist struggles like within the 60s, 70s, 80s, and even it's relevant today, um, and also um, a lot of a lot of the the struggles that were going on in the 80s, like from from my sort of research into, into my film that I made, um, was around police brutality which was affecting um, men and women um, within the 80s and it's still affecting us now um, and um, and also you know, around employment rights and education and reform within the welfare of the state um, and there are some similarities and overlaps with, with, with uh, the US perspective but I don't, I don't know if you want to say more about the US um. Well, I'll say a little bit about the Canadian experience, and I think some of it then travels here to the UK. So certainly there was a moment when there was a kind of politicization of the category black here that brought together people of African descent, but also from other colonized countries as well. So there was a kind of politicization in a way that was different here. In Canada, of course, there were, you know, women of color became a very strong category. But before that, there was a really strong black women's movement that organized as a black women's movement. But with the Canadian state adopting multiculturalism as official policy, it kind of had its impact in the women's movement by splintering these organizations along cultural lines. So the black women's movement, for example, was forced to the politics of funding and the politics of multiculturalism to become part of a larger coalition which was called Visible and Minority Women. So, you know, we have a very kind of active link between multiculturalism as state policy and the depoliticization of anti-racist movements and a, and a kind of culturalization of those movements. I think that moment comes later in, in the UK, where again communities, you know, are uh, um, organized along cultural lines. There is a splintering of that kind of unified moment that we see earlier. And I link that very much to the politics of multiculturalism. For us, they were imposed by the state. I think here they come in a different kind of a process, but they have the same impact of culturalizing groups, breaking them apart, and making the building of solidarity really, really very, very hard. So that's one point. There's another point that I think, if I can just take two more minutes, that's raised in the film, which is very important in the North American context, both in the US and Canada, and that is the relationship to indigenous women. And we see here you know, in the 70s, that the indigenous women are there in a coalition. But I think that the, the big, and I call this a really big mistake in the politics of women of color feminism, is that, you know, there was a tendency to see indigenous women as just another group of women who also experienced oppression. And that somehow these oppressions were parallel and that we could unite across them just by acknowledging difference. Whereas in Canada and the US, they're both settler societies, colonial settler societies, which are predicated on genocidal violence against indigenous peoples. So to think that that struggle or that experience is somehow parallel, and all we need to do is to just build unity across by recognizing each other, I think that was a politics that we've had to pay a heavy price for. Because of course when we hear the indigenous women speak, the politics are around sovereignty. And sovereignty meant that women of color in Canada, in the US, had to acknowledge that we were living on stolen land. And that politics of solidarity could only come from a place of contesting settler colonialism, which is what US and Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Israel, classic examples of set settler colonial societies with race as the foundation. And so I think that's an important lesson we've had to learn. Yeah? And it's interesting to see how this issue arises in the 70s. I think that the concept of 
blackness as a political identity is making a resurgence, at least in the UK. So we have groups like black feminists kind of re-emerging, I think in a way that is really um, inspiring, kind of hopeful. And I think that, you know, in other contexts, like the Canadian context, with the I Don't Know More movement, we also see, I think, a, a dealing with those failures, at least amongst some um, progressive women of color, political organizations and groups and individuals. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to, um, I guess, bring a note of hope into the discussion. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask another question to the panel, which will be my final one, and then we'll turn it, open, uh, turn it over to the audience. And um, I wanted to ask about uh, the way in which the interviews end off with referring to attacks on immigrants, and the rise of Islamophobia as a particular form of racism that, of course, um, becomes quite virulent after 9-11. Um, attacks on the poor, which we can relate to um, the austerity politics, which we're grappling with here. And, um, and also what Sanera just talked about in terms of indigenous women's issues. And I guess I just wanted to ask about, you know, when, when the interviewees end off with saying, Nevlin, it's your turn now. <laughs> what are your thoughts on um, sort of the directions that um, black feminism in that expansive political sense uh, might take at this moment? Um, well, I'll just respond to the last bit of the question, um, or your, your response. Um, I think Nevelyn's actually responding to it. I mean, to me, the film is definitely a form of arts activism. It's definitely taken the next stage of, of this, you know, of the black women's movement through the documentary process. And I think that function, to me, is, is, is definitely activism to me. Um, and in the process of actually going to, through the gatekeepers and, and various other people, getting archive footage, finding these people, the people that are part of the movement, I mean, that's, that's you know, a, a revolutionary hack, because it's, it's very difficult I, to make a, an, an hour and 20 minute film. Um, it's a great feat, so I congratulate you on, on the film for that. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about the... Yeah, I do want to make two points, but I don't know if you want to say anything before you do, or you should I go first? Okay, okay. So two points about you know the challenges that we face now. One is an issue that comes up here, and you also um, raised it: the question of sexism and racism, and how to you know deal with both at the same moment. I think it's really important to see that the problem of sexism, as it emerges within the African American community in the U.S., is in the context of U.S. society. It cannot be understood outside of the history of slavery, right? So when we talk about sexism, it has a particular American kind of shape to it. And to talk about it out of context of that, I found very problematic. Yeah? So that has to be the first point. You know, the myth of the black rapist. And I, I know that Angela Davis and other black feminists have written about this extensively, taking it, it uh, on. You know, the idea that somehow black men are more hyper-masculine or more invested in masculinity or more sexist you know, what we used to call the third world machismo theory. It still continues to hold ground. And I think that women of color really need to grapple with that politics, and I don't think we've done that very well. There's a defensiveness, there's an apologetics around it, and I think it needs to be kind of taken head on, that this is a particular form of sexism that emerges in a particular society, in a particular social context, instead of owning it as a problem as somehow inherent in our communities. And I think that that politics has really surfaced now with Islamophobia. Because what we see is the kind of representation of the Muslim male as the hyper-misogynist, hyper-patriarchal, hyper-violent. And for me, it's a continuation in a different moment of the black male rapist myth. You now have, you know, which I'm not saying that's gone away, it's still very much there, but you now have the Muslim men as hyper-patriarchal, hyper-violent. So you see how that kind of shapes 
the construct of men of color. And I think that you know one of the speakers towards the end of the film identifies Islamophobia as a form of racism. I think that's absolutely right. I don't think Muslim operates as a religious category today. It operates as a racial category. It's what I call a religious racial category now. And I think that you know we have to learn from our past history. How do we deal with this um, construct of men from racialized communities in this very, very destructive way and how not to feed that? And I think that the, the, you know, uh, it was an absolutely correct point that this is a politics of divide and rule. And I think that divide and rule is now along the lines of Islamophobia. And you know, to me, that is kind of taking us in a, in a, in a very, very destructive path. Uh, both uh, you know, at the, in the countries that we live in, but also internationally. And that's something that I think has to be a kind of urgent task for black feminists, feminists of color, and uh, you know, other feminists who can build alliances with, is how to take that on, learn from our history you know, about how we have fought back against these kinds of really, really destructive constructs of masculinity. Uh, thank you. I just first want to say that you've all had amazing commentary, and uh, I feel like I've learned a lot. Um, and um, I I will comment on the, the last part of your question, and also the first question that you had. If I can manage to remember everything. <laughs> um, so I think that today's... Um, Today's activism amongst uh, women of color looks very different, obviously. I see a lot more activism going on on the internet. Um, a lot of, uh, well, it's, it's become a, a great platform where just anybody can, you know, start a blog and write about their personal experiences, or they can organize and start um, petitions and send them off to thousands and millions of people or, um, you know, start collective. Uh, I know that, uh, you know, that Black Feminist is, it has a website and a lot of uh, your outreach is on the internet, is that? Yeah, on Twitter as well. Right, and so social media, which also I'm going to get to. Um, and also, um, I am part of an artist collective um, called the New Negress Film Society. Uh, we support black female filmmakers and we formed as a response to the predominantly white male industry that we are part of and we felt very marginalized. Um, and even, you know, we recognize that even black male filmmakers have certain privileges and visibility that we don't have. And so we wanted to form a supportive space for, um, for black female filmmakers. Um, that's sort of one of the types of activism that I know that I'm part of. Um, so it, the resources are different. I know that Haley raised a point, actually, in our personal discussion before this panel about the restrictions of social media um, and the activism that occurs on social media, Facebook, Twitter, blogs and everything is that in our generation it's just a discussion and you have a lot of uh, feminists, you know, even a lot of a lot more white feminists now that you know it's like becoming politically correct to include intersectionality in the discussion and feminism and that you know, it's the word that's being tossed around here and there, and um, it's it just becoming a discussion. There's no action around it. Um, there's um, it's it doesn't. It's not like that hardcore grassroots organized. I mean, I'm not going to speak. There are certainly certainly people who are doing some hardcore organizing, but a lot of it is discussion and theorization, which is something that, something else. no reality, there's no person, there's, it's not grounded in reality. And these are very real, these concepts, intersectionality and all these huge words that most people don't even understand, have it rooted in reality and, and get out there and actually do some real work. Um, so those are the limitations of uh, sort of our brand of feminism, but there are also, also a lot of 
you know, a lot more access that we have and advantages that we have that previous generations may not have had. Then the first question, I don't know how much time I have. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I'm not keeping track. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the first question um, about how, how this intersectionality, um, the, the problems that occurred back then, how it relates to today, I would say that um, it's still going on. Like I see these, a lot of these issues, I mean, a lot of the, the things that these women were talking about were granted specific to their organization, but I would say one of the most prominent examples that I always um, point out is that um, in the US, and actually a lot of you have probably heard about this because it's just so visible, you know, um, just whenever the African American community comes out about, you know, its own issues, it's always about black men's issues and, um, or not really black men's issues because things like mass incarceration and police brutality, they actually still, they affect black women, but they're not, um, you know, you've never seen a march for a black woman, have you? You've never heard of, like, I mean, you've never, you've heard of, like, Trayvon Martin and all that, but you haven't heard of, you know, all the other black women who were shot by the police, who were brutalized or uh, sexually assaulted, and that's the other thing, that um, sexual assault, which disproportionately affects black women and women of color, that's not even talked about, but it, it's a, that's like, that is a, a form of, uh, that, that is a form of um, genocide in a way. Uh, just in it, it's not murdering, but it's, it's like, it's, it's a war tactic, you know? And it's not something that's talked about at all. So I would say that in terms of including, you know, gender issues or black women's issues in the conversation, in the black community in the US, it's just not really there. And I think that it's a lot more stagnant, actually, than in the uh, broader feminist community, the, the white feminist community, because at least there's like that intersectionality word being thrown around, and there's like, okay, we'll include you here and there, but it's like, you know, just not talked about that much, um, especially as a real, like, this is something that happens to black women, and this is something we need to pay attention to um, on a national level. So that's what I would say, um, how it relates to today. It's still going on. Um, but thankfully, there's more resources and more spaces where we can have women of color organizing openly, so. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to make one comment, and that's that it seems that um, in, in regards to the film and also our discussion, that one thing that comes across really strongly is the need for women of color, for black women, to organize uh, on our own. And I think that there was a shift to trying to, with, with the lip service to race and intersectionality, perhaps a, a brief moment where um, there was a thinking that maybe, um, you know, women of color would be would find a place in mainstream feminism. Um, but I think more and more there's a, there's a need to go back, actually, to the kinds of organizations that um, we've been discussing. Okay, um, let's open it up to the floor. So, yes? I just want to make a comment about, there's a mic there, actually, which might... <clears throat> okay. I just wanted to make a comment about the... Um, particularly about the film or some commentary that I heard, that heard here. Um, the film seemed to me as if it didn't really, I mean, I'm a, a radical feminist and it didn't really seem to, um, there wasn't this sort of particular um, acknowledgement of issues that I would consider to be, um, of, you know, of profound importance to feminist politics in terms of um, issues to do with rape, issues to do with, with prostitution, and issues to do with pornography and, and you know, domestic male violence, those things didn't come across from the, the, the film. Um, you know, the women were mainly focusing upon class issues and to do with um, you know, economic um, inequality and exploitation issues. And um, 
also I feel that I would like to say that um, with regards to you made a comment about the um, um, about the, the masculinity of men of color and you know you seem to suggest that it's a concern for, for black feminists or um, uh, feminists of color to to address that um, I would disagree with that I think that you know men of color do um, implement a, a system of male supremacy and I think that they need to be held accountable from a feminist perspective from a feminist critical perspective um, you know I think that they, you, there are issues to do with the whole black um, you know the race the, the, the rape myth um, but I think that those kinds of um, criticisms about the rape myth do, do, does to me does sort of discount the, the possibility or even the fact that black men were involved in raping white women as long as, alongside white men raping white women and so on. It, there's not that kind of perspective, isn't sort of, it's not really very circular, it just seems to be very kind of honing in on the, the actual, you know, the, the racism um, perspective of, of defining black men as rapists. Um, yeah. Are there other questions that, so I could take a, a few comments? Okay, so let's take uh, the woman in the white shirt and the woman in the green shirt, and then uh, we can have a response from the panel. Um, hi. Uh, I, I just wanted to address this issue of black and the use of the term black. And it's been suggested here today that, um, that you know, it's a very happy party and it's all unified. Um, from my experiences, there's actually been quite a lot of conflict around the term black and around inclusivity and these issues of women of colour that hasn't been spoken to here today. It's just been suggested that we all love each other and we're, we've got these things in common. To a degree, I, I mean, sweepingly. Um, and what I wanted to say, um, I'm concerned, I feel increasingly, well, it's, it's a historical problem, but I actually feel black women, as in women of African descent, are often marginalised and marginalised even in our own movements. And I feel that there is a problem about the, the way that other races of women behave, and including minority women behave, who often have a lot more resources and have spaces that we do not as, as women of African descent. And I think that there are particular issues affecting black women, not just representation and the disgusting um, treatment of our stereotypes and just very serious issues that we don't seem to have a platform for. And so for me, I'd like to talk about, I'd like you to say something about, and even in the film where they talked about letting the Puerto Rican women in, and then it became the third world movement. And I, I, I just feel that oftentimes black women have sort of been this backbone, we've done work, and then other people come constantly and take the benefits of that, and we're just sort of there, still suffering, still with our problems. And so I, I really personally, I think that that needs to be addressed. I think there needs to be a specific acknowledgement of, of the particularities of being a black woman of African descent. Thank you. Hi, um, I wanted to sort of, I guess, change the tone of the questioning, actually. I think in a lot of conversations about um, black feminism, there are, and as a black feminist myself, um, and knowing many other black feminists and being involved in black feminists, I wanted to ask the panel about the um, consistent, what I would probably call the weight of the world on your sh shoulders syndrome where you're almost sort of burdened with educating people about why sexism is an issue, why racism is, is an issue. When we speak about the racist interpretations of our, uh, of our male counterparts, of men of colour, it's often, if not always, it's black feminists who are um, pushed into this place between a rock and a hard place where you see these, um, you, you recognise male supremacy and male violence in your own communities. You also see these racist depictions you almost feel like you want, you want to call out the racism or, or the sexism, but you almost feel like you're letting the side down or betraying either side. And, and personally, as a person who certainly feels that burden, I want to ask the panel if that's a thing that you feel and you know, how you deal with that, because we can't educate the world. We can't bring up the children and do the unpaid labor and you know, be responsible for revolutionary political thought. And that's something that often comes from black feminist thought. Like, some of the some of the best sort of critiques of the way that the world works like like i guess when do we get a break and and who else takes that burden 
Thanks. Thanks very much for all of your comments and questions, and I'll turn it over to the panel for some thoughts. All right. Uh, so um, these were very good questions, um, and I, I appreciate it. Um, very different from what I usually get, so that's good. <laughs> Okay, so the, the first question um, about the film not addressing um, prostitution, rape, pornography. Um, so basically the film was just intended to, I wanted, I wanted the women to speak openly about their story. I didn't, I didn't pigeonhole them into any particular topic that narr that's a very very specific topic um, that I don't know if they have a lot of experience with because they were not working they were not sex workers um, I do acknowledge the um, I acknowledge how important it is to raise these issues in the broader discussion but when you're making a film you have to sort of streamline it um, in into you know what the film is about, and so I feel like there were there are a lot of topics actually besides that that were not raised or that we didn't really go into um, because they would have frankly opened up a can of worms that I can't you know I wasn't able to put in there, so I couldn't squeeze everything in there, um, and those women did not talk about prostitution at all. They were speaking about their experiences in the organization. Um, I asked them about, um, you know, broad questions like, "Was there any? How did you feel discriminated against?" So it was about them, you know, what they experienced. Um, and then the footage was just reflective of the stories that they told. Um, so I feel like that probably deserves its own film. <laughs> that um, I mean. I, if if that is something that you know um, you feel is important, I I would actually encourage you to make it because we we do need that out there. Um, so yeah, it's pretty much it. Um, and I the the second um, question about black women's issues needing to you know just we need to focus on our own issues. Um, I actually am, I actually agree with you, and I think that that we need spaces where we can focus on our issues and then spaces where we can also unite, um, but we can't always unite around everything because, you know, we need our own spaces. Um, and I mean, I've encountered this even with, you know, the New Negress Film Society, do we want to open this up to all other women of color? Do they face the same issues that we face? We haven't gotten to that stage yet. We're still developing, but we have considered that. And that remind your question reminded me of that. Cola, Cola Booth, actually, uh, before I get into that, the, the film originally was very centered on that perspective. Uh, originally, it was about the specific hatred of black women. And Cola Booth, um, she is from that sort of era of the film. I don't know if you're familiar with any of, okay, because you sound like you are. <laughs> so um, she, Cola Booth talks about this, um, how black women are erased um, in, you know, and how, I mean, she's, she's very radical in a lot of ways. And she talks about how, um, you know, that in America, you know, com for her coming over as an immigrant and, you know, she's very dark skinned and then she comes over and in, in Africa, she never saw any black women who identified as black, but they were very light skinned with, um, you know, the wavy hair, they were very biracial looking, and that black men actually, and black people identified them as black, and so you're able to say, okay, I'm gonna put this light skinned woman or this biracial woman on television as representative of you, and we're not gonna have you on there, or we're gonna depict you as, you know, these uh, disgusting characters, 
um, it's a form of erasure. So they, there are very particular concerns and lots of colorism that, that goes on, um, you know, just in, in broader society. So I think that's a very interesting point to raise. And that's, that's why even though I had women of different, you know, backgrounds in the film that, um, I mean, you know, I, I still wanted it to be centered on black women, you know, speaking and um, their experiences. And by the way, back, the, back then, all of those women were considered black. Like, they had check boxes and they were all considered black. There was no such thing as, like, biracial or multiracial. So it was a different time and, you know, race as a category is always fluid depending on who wants to benefit from it, you know? Um, so I think we have to keep that in mind too. Um, the last question, I'm actually, I'm keeping the, the very first, um, the, the first woman in mind for, for you too. Um, the last question is, could you? <laughs> it was about burdens. Burdens, yeah. okay. Um, it, Basically, when you were talking, it reminded me of a book um, about, um, I think it's the, the Black Macho and the Myth of the Superwoman. Um, okay, so you've, you're familiar with that. Um, I don't, I guess, I don't really, I don't really have an answer because I'm still figuring out a lot of stuff myself. Um, I would say that I just personally, like, I try not to, um, like, feel, I guess it's all about, like, how you view yourself and your role, too. Like, a lot of black women feel like, and I, there was actually some footage in there that I never included of Cleo Silver as one of the Black Panther women speaking about how, um, you know, black women should, don't have the luxury of, um, living a certain way or having a certain quality of life because we have to take care of black men. And I think that, you know, for me, I don't adopt that perspective. But a lot of black women do feel like they have to take care of um, black men and, you know, baby them. And, um, like, they um, take in their sons who, for, until age X, and, you know, they, they're poor themselves, but they're, I mean, I, this is something that I see, you know, but they're still supporting them and um, just a lot of things going on. I think that it's an indoctrination as well that we have to be this for everybody, that we have to be everyone's mammy. It's a racist caricature and stereotype, but it's something that a lot of black women have internalized because the black community, at least in the US, reinforces that and tells black women that they have to be that. But I think for women who do not internalize that, that life might look very different for them and that they might, you know, find themselves, or at least for me, I just find myself, um, I dedicated to, you know, I care about everybody's liber liberation, like, um, you know, women, men, animals, the earth, everything. But I don't feel like burdened to give up myself or sacrifice myself for you know for someone else's benefit you know especially like when they have privileges that i don't have so thank you um, okay do you want to give very brief replies because we're sort of yes i'll give very very brief replies uh, my point wasn't about not holding black men or any other group of men accountable for violence for rape that wasn't my point my point really was about how we think about masculinity and femininity. And to think that if, you know, I, I think that we need to have a much more complicated understanding of masculinity and of femininity within racialized minority communities is also shaped by factors from the outside, not only internal to the community. That was my point, and I, I'll stand by that. And I don't take that to mean that we don't hold men accountable for their behavior, for their violence. I just think that we need a much more sophisticated understanding of masculinity and femininity. Um, the point around 
uh, black women's issues being specific and many other women of color actually using their privilege against black women. I think that's an absolutely spot on point. I really agree with that. And I try to talk about how all these struggles are not parallel. And the example I used was around indigenous women. And maybe I should have used you know, a, another example. But the uh, location, the positionality of different groups of racialized women are not parallel. These struggles are not parallel. And we have to talk about relationality and the power imbalances between us as well. So I think that's a really important point, and I'm glad you raised it again. In terms of uh, the last, but just yeah. one more, <laughs> one more, right? The, the question about burden, the relationship between racism and sexism, I think we really have to stop and ask what forms of male violence become hyper-visible in society? And what forms of male violence do not become hyper-visible? And if I look at black men, you know, the rapist myth, it's right there. We know that white men have raped historically on a much larger scale, but somehow that is not visible. So I think when we look at the kinds of sexual violence and violence against women, which are the kinds that become hyper-visible? I think we have to pay real strong attention to that. Thanks. Okay, um, I just wanted to uh, add... Oh. <laughs> Just before we wrap up, I just wanted to end on a note about, um, to the, uh, in regards to the second comment that was made. And I also wanted to agree with Sonera that I thought the point was absolutely right. Um, but I wanted to end on a note of, of thinking about the politics of solidarity and how important it is um, in thinking about what solidarity means. It means, in the context of working together, to acknowledge these specific histories and particular forms of oppression. But that's the challenge for a politics of solidarity that um, I think is, is, is really crucial. Um, so just to wrap up, I wanted to echo the comments of Sunera and Haley in congratulating Nevlin on an absolutely uh, brilliant film. And I'm really happy that you, you, you are here. We were able to have this discussion with you. And I really hope to see you back for more screenings in the future. So thank you very much. Yeah,